I'm still in need of your support of my ministry. So if you are moved by the Lord to contribute some help, then go to the links down below in the description and you can click on there and make a donation. I've got uh, a link for euros, I've got a link for US dollars, so that makes it easier whether you're in Europe or you're in America. Thank you for your support in my ministry among the Ukrainians here who are suffering as I preach the gospel to them and I provide actual tangible support to them. Now on with the lesson. So today we're going to talk about repentance. Repentance is a very important topic in the New Testament, but it's critical to your salvation. Now, most of you have gone through repentance in order to become a Christian. And you can recall a time when you felt guilty for your sins. You felt remorse for your sins. And you got before God and you poured out your heart before God. I mean in prayer, speaking to God, opening your mouth, saying things with your tongue about your own actions, your own thoughts, your own feelings, and all of these things that were wicked. And you told God about those. And you told God you were sorry for those. And you asked God to forgive you to take away the guilt of those. And if you were under a Bible preacher, you would have been told that you must also commit to not sinning again. You must stop your sinning. Now, even if you did that last step as well, probably you found that it was very hard that you were tempted, even on the same day, that you were tempted again to do some of the sins that you'd already been doing that you felt remorse over before God and spoke to Him about and asked for forgiveness. Now that temptation is not sin. The question is whether you indulged in that action again. If you indulged in that again, you did sin again. But if you were just tempted with the idea of doing it, that's temptation, that's not sin. Keep those separate. That's important for the idea of repentance. Because repentance sits right between those two. Repentance sits right between those two and keeps them separate. That's what the word repent means. And I'm going to prove that by the word itself. It's metanoia. All right, it's one word, metanoia. But meta is a prefix that means in the midst of something, in the midst of something. So in the midst of something. Noo is the verb for to exercise the mind, the strength of the mind. To exercise that strength of the mind, here, your guts, as we say in English, or siswa in Finnish. It's your strength here. This is the fortitude of the mind. In the Bible, the mind goes all the way down. The kidneys are the reins of the mind. And then this is, this is the fortitude of the mind, the will. It's in the liver. But it's here, right here. So you need to exercise that with manly valor. That's a word in the Bible, actually, manly valor. In the midst of the occasion, every occasion, from the time that you start your repentance for the rest of your life. That's what that word means. So, now that you understand what that word means, repent. To exercise your mind in the midst of the occasion. To do what is right and to not do what is wrong. Okay? It's that choice. It's the keeping separate of the temptation from the sin. Keeping that separate. So that even when you're tempted, you don't bring it together to sin. All right, it's that metanoia, exercising the strength of the mind to keep those separate. So temptation does not lead to sin. All right, so with that in mind, now let's look at these couple passages. The first one is actually a combination of two. It's Luke 3 and Matthew 3. So I'll start with Matthew. 
<clears throat> Matthew 3, 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, exercise the mind in the midst of the occasion, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Okay? So if you're exercising your mind in the midst of the occasion, keeping temptation and sin separate, you're making the paths of the Lord straight. But John the Baptist came doing that. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. All right, just because you see weirdos dressing weird and eating weird, you know, vegan and whatever, don't think that they're John the Baptist or someone holy or someone special or anything like that. Right? That's not the point of this. He's, they're just describing him. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice, they were confessing their sins. All right? The word baptized means to be immersed. It's not sprinkling of water. Okay? It means full immersion. That's the word means that. And were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, you nest of snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who let you in on what's happening? Then he says to them, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. This is critical. We're going to focus in on this with these passages. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, worthy of exercising your mind in the midst of the occasion. Bear fruit worthy of exercising the mind in the midst of the occasions. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, there it is, fruit again. Good fruit does not bear good fruit. So, we know that fruits worthy of repentance is good fruit. And we know that good fruit comes from repentance. Fruits worthy of repentance. All right, keep going here. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, unto the exercising of your mind in the midst of the occasion. So the baptism, the purpose of it, is to continue to live from then on out in this exercising of the fortitude of your mind in the midst of every occasion, holding temptation and sin apart. I indeed baptize you with water unto the exercising of the mind in the midst of the occasion. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You're not going to be fully immersed in water then. You will with John's baptism. But with Jesus' baptism, you'll be fully immersed in the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he is thoroughly, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now the wheat, when it's separated from the chaff, the chaff is that light hull that's on the outside. And so they'll sift that out. And that winnowing fork allows the wheat kernels to fall through. But the chaff, which is lighter, is caught and is a little larger because it fans out a little bit. And so this winnowing fan actually separates the 
the wheat kernels from the chaff, which is that light, wispy hull. And then what happens is they throw that into the fire and it burns up because you, you don't want to use that in making the wheat, for the, uh, making the bread, the flour for the bread. All right. So now let's go over to Luke chapter 3. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the broods of vipers here in that one. Okay. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 2. Because verse 1 is just about the politics, the political situation. And it says, um, The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. That's John the Baptist. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's more specific. So a, an exercise, he, he preached a baptism, an immersion in water, for the exercising of the mind in the midst of the occasion to keep sin and temptation separate for the remission of sins. So for the remission of sins, that's sins to be, to be uh, sent off, off or away from you. Sins that are on you, that you've committed. So that's different than the keeping separate of temptation and sin. That's sin that you haven't committed yet. You're keeping that at bay when temptation comes on you. You're keeping the resulting sin that would result from that at bay. That's exercising the mind in the midst of the occasion. Okay? But the remission of sins is the result of that. Okay? And we've got the same thing in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 7. And he makes that point here in John 1, 7. A lot of people argue against it because they don't know the gospel accounts of Luke and Matthew, for example. So in, in John 1, 1 John 1, 7, it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. This is to purge. The word is purge. So you got the idea of walking in the light as he is in the light. And two verses before it says, God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. All right, so that means you need to be already exercising the mind in the midst of the occasion to not sin and to do what's right. To not let temptation lead you into sin. Okay, so that's, that's 1 John 1, 7. And the result of it is that Jesus' blood will purge us of all sin. Yeah? And so here you've got the same thing. John came preaching a baptism of repentance, the exercising of the mind in the midst of the occasion, for the remission of sins, so that your sins are remiss if you are exercising your mind in the midst of the occasion. Verse 4. How, how, we're going through... All right, all right. So, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So in this case, he didn't single out the Pharisees and Sadducees, though we know from Matthew that he did. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Bear fruits worthy of exercising your mind in the midst of the occasion. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now... The axe is laid, at the root, laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? This is different than in Matthew. Okay? They said, What shall we do then? Ah, it's a very good question, isn't it? All right. So, what is this good fruit worthy of repentance? That's what their question is. What is this good fruit worthy of repentance that we must do? Because they know that it's actions. That's why they ask this question. Because he said, every tree that does not bear good fruit 
will be cut down. And their response is, what shall we do then? Because they understand that good fruit is good actions. Fruit is actions. They know that. John knows that. Now you know that. <laughs> okay? All right. It says, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Don't cheat for yourself. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone, or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. So there are three things that the soldiers were doing that were sins. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will immerse you fully with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people. Let's go to Luke 13. All right, Luke 13. Starting in verse 1, we're going, all right, so there were present at, the, at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, and Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? We talked about this recently. I will tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you exercise your mind in the midst of the occasion to keep temptation apart from sin, to not sin and do what's right, you will likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, exercise your mind in the midst of the occasion, you will all likewise perish. He's saying it clearly. Unless you use your mind, the strength of your mind, to keep sin at bay and do what's right, you will perish also. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, like good, okay. But if not, after that you can cut it down. All right. So what do we find from that? Because he says that on the heels of twice saying to them that unless you repent, exercise your mind in the midst of the occasion to keep sin at bay and do what's right, you will likewise perish. Unless you bear the fruit of repentance, the good fruit of repentance, you will likewise perish. The good fruit worthy of repentance. So the parable of the fig tree, it had already repented, but was not producing fruit worthy of repentance, the figs. It was there. It was in the ground where it should be, where the vineyard owner came and looked for fruit, right? But there was no fruit worthy of the repentance. So it had repented. It had exercised its mind in the midst of the occasion. Yeah? Well, how is that possible? How is it possible? If you're exercising your mind in the midst of the occasion, 
but you're not bearing good fruit. How is that possible? Clearly it's not. It says here, this taking up ground represents having repented, having exercised the mind in the midst of the occasion, at least started to, right? Three years was long enough to produce fruit worthy of repentance in this parable. Second chance of one more year where the keeper of the vineyard will help. The keeper of the vineyard will help the tree by digging around it and fertilizing it. That's me. I'm the keeper, to, keeper of the vineyard and you're the tree. And as I preach to you, I'm digging around you and I'm fertilizing you. And if you're still not going to produce fruit worthy of repentance, then you will be cut down. That's what it says. If with the help of the vineyard keeper, that tree still does not produce fruit worthy of repentance, it will be cut down out of the ground of repentant fruit trees. You're there where repentant fruit trees belong. And if you do not bear the good fruit that is worthy of repentance, there is no repentance. It's not worth anything. It's faith without actions is dead. These ideas are all throughout the New Testament and all throughout the Bible. But especially the New Testament is very clear that these things are repeated over and over again, not only in Jesus' most sacred and important teachings, but in the teachings of the apostles and the teachings of Paul and the teachings of the author of Hebrews and of Jude, of all of them. You must bear fruit, good fruit, that's worthy of exercising your mind in the midst of the occasion to keep sin at bay so that temptation doesn't lead into sin. It's even in the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There it is. You cannot let temptation lead into sin. You must exercise the mind in the midst of the occasion with the power of God through faith and action that produces the good fruit. May the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.